Good day, everyone. Welcome to the first session of Drought Indices and Indicators for the Northeast U.S. We are very glad that you've been able to join us today for a wrap-up of an exciting multi-year research project combining the efforts of many institutions. Among them, Drought Research Institution, or DRI, the lead researchers, the Cooperative Institutes for Research in Environmental Sciences, that is CERES, the Northeast Region Climate Center, NRCC, and NOAA's National Integrated Drought Information System, or NIDAS. My name is Sylvia Reeves, and I am NIDAS's Northeast Region Drought Information Coordinator. Co-hosting with me today is my NIDAS colleague, Adam Lang, who is our Communications Director. Adam will say hello to you a little bit later. NIDAS is a multi-agency partnership that coordinates drought monitoring, forecasting, and planning and information at a national, tribal, and state and regional level. Today's presentation highlights one of the many research efforts that focus on improving our drought early warning capacity. We are excited to get started today, but just a few reminders to uh, get us going today. Everyone should know that this webinar is being recorded and will be made available for viewing later in just a few weeks. I will be monitoring the chat box along with Adam and the research team, uh, but I'll be interacting with some of you as you put questions into the chat box for the presenters. Hopefully, we will be able to answer some of those questions right after each presentation, but we'd like to attack most of the Q&A in our final discussion session uh, at the end of the webinar today. Please let us know if you um, let us know if you have a question, please let us know your name or contact information so that we can forward a question in case we don't get to address it. We'll make sure that the presenters have an opportunity to reach out and contact you by email. Next, I would like to introduce the project lead, Dr. Dan McAvoy. Dan is the Regional Climatologist at the Western Region Climate Center and the Desert Research Institute. He'll take a few moments this morning to introduce his team and uh, share an overview of this Coping with Drought, CWD as we call it, project. Thank you, Dan. All right, well, thanks, Sylvia. That was great, and, and thank you for the introductions. Um, let me share my screen here. Uh, real quick and um so yeah my name is dan mcavoy and i am a uh, climatologist at the desert research institute in reno nevada and i just want to uh, real briefly before we get started cover why we're having this webinar today um and the second one ne next week as well so we're wrapping up a, a multi-year project that was funded through NOAA's uh, Climate Program Office. And the project uh, title was Identifying Timescales and Tools to Support the Northeast Dews and Management of Different Drought Types. Um, and so today uh, we're going to cover some of the research highlights that came out of this project. Um, so I just wanted to really briefly introduce the project team and some of the collaborators. Um, so uh, I am the lead and, and also from DRI uh, is uh, Shuang Zai, who is a graduate research, research assistant uh, working on his master's degree, who will, will be presenting. And then we have a uh, team from uh, uh, Colorado, uh, including Imtiaz Rangwala, Heather Yoakum, and Mike Hobbins. Um, and we've also been collaborating uh, with Sylvia and uh, uh, Art De Gatano from the Northeast Regional Climate Center and the Northeast Dews. Um, and so Sylvia briefly covered a bit about NIDAS and the Dews, and I just wanted to mention that this uh, Northeast Dews, as you can uh, see on the map here, is one of uh, a number of drought early warning systems across uh, the U.S. and so the, the Northeast is one of the more recently established ones. I believe it began in 2016 and so part of this work is to integrate uh, some new research and information to uh, to improve the uh, 
the information that goes into the drought early warning system and drought monitoring and uh, early warning in general for the Northeast US. So we had a few objectives that we wanted to cover with this project. The main one here was to identify the most effective drought indicators for hydrologic and ag agricultural drought monitoring in the Northeast. And this has to do with different time scales of drought. We talking uh, a few months, a few weeks, or things that occur over multiple years at a time. Uh, what index or indicator, what combination works the best for different impacts. And some of the things we're looking at are, are temperature, precipitation, evapotranspiration, evaporative demand, soil moisture, snowpack. And so how can this information be used to strengthen the Northeast dews and further uh, incorporated into management and, and planning? And so a couple of the main things that we focused on um, was which time scales um, provide the most information related to the detection of early onset of crop stress. And uh, Shuang will be presenting on that today. Um, and then another one we were looking at is snow drought in the, in the Northeast US. And so understanding what are the primary drivers of snow droughts in the Northeast? How do we quantify these snow droughts in the Northeast? And um, what type of data sets can we use in the Northeast to examine snow droughts? Um, and so uh, we, we had several research topics, but we were also interested in hearing from our, our stakeholders to understand uh, a lot of different aspects of how this information could be useful to them. Uh, the sectors that we were, were, were looking to were agriculture, water resources, uh, research and academics, recreation, and, and we're interested in learning about other uh, institutions that, or I'm sorry, um, other sectors that can benefit from this. Um, and so are there new needs for new information and tools? Um, and are, are there other groups or agencies who might be interested in providing feedback on this project? So uh, please keep all this in, in mind as you're listening to the presentations today. Um, and we're happy to take your questions and feedback as we uh, as we go through uh, towards the end of this project. And so with that, um, we're going to move on to our first presenter, um, Shuang Zai, who's going to be presenting on uh, drought index relationships to crop uh, crop health and crop conditions. So I'm going to pass it over to Shuang there. Uh, okay. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Dan and Sylvia, for the introduction. My name is Shuang Xiai. And I'm now a research assistant at the Desert Research Institute. So I've been working closely with Dan and the team. It's my honor to analyze drought indices and crop health for the Northeast Drought Early Warning System, aka Northeast Deuce. And I'm very excited to have this chance to present the result we have. So why do we do this in the first place? Northeast, by old impression, was a humid region. Studies even showed that the region was generally wetter since 2000. Discussions on agricultural drought have seldom been focused on the Northeast. However, a historic dry event swept the region during the summer growing season of 2016, caused severe economic loss to agricultural sectors and related industries. People were shocked by the news and paid close attention, which led to the establishment of Northeast dues. Then again, unfortunately, in 2020, last year, we had another record drought. It is urgent for us to understand how these dry events may impact crops by best representing, linking, and comparing drought to crop health in the region. We believe the outcome will potentially aid local farmers, stakeholders uh, in better decision making and help the Northeast and other management units more easily uh, achieve their goals. Here's an outline. First, I introduce the general method, technical issues, and our innovations to resolve them. Then I show the result of correlating crop yield to drought indices. At last, there will be a time series comparison for 2016 and 2020. Here we go. 
So the first thing we need to resolve is the study area. The common sense of the Northeast climate region is comprised of 12 states. However, the Northeast Dews only consists of New England and the state of New York. So we think the best choice is to retain as much climate feature as possible while discarding those relatively small states without much crop cover. So we included the entire Northeast Dews region plus Pennsylvania and the Garden State, New Jersey. The next thing we need to decide is which species to focus on. Some crops are highly profitable, like apples, member syrup, floral culture, and so on. But their area coverage are not sufficient for, for example, statewide spatial analysis. So to achieve that, the coverage also needs to be even across the region. And for the last requirement, we want it to be mostly rain-fed in order to reflect natural forcing. So this chart shows the acreage. You can see hay, corn, soybean, and winter wheat are most widely cultivated across the area. So in these maps, colors indicate the ratio of the land area covered by each crop. Apparently, hay and corn takes up the most in the region. Today, I'll focus on corn as in this example. Well, specifically, I choose corn silage because it's more sensitive to drought than the grain. Uh, for crop data, we use three types of them in the study, all from the National Agricultural Statistics Service, aka NAS. So first, the raster map of vegetation layer. They are 30 meters pixels, making totally around 2 billion pixels on this image, which uh, with each representing a vegetation type. So there are 12 years of this map, so we packed them together and took the average onto one year. Then the annual yield data. We have them at county level for New York, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey, while state level for New England. We applied linear detrending to the yield as is necessary because we only care about the fluctuation rather than the overall tendency. Yes and no, for crops, we don't consider the general climate change through the decades. As it's mixed with many other factors like evolving technology or improved farmland management or something unknown. And lastly, the crop condition. We have them weekly at the state level. They're in percentage of excellent, good, fair, poor, and very poor. So we derive a crop health score to conform them. And that's all for crop data. Then the drought. Speaking of drought, there are always three leading characters on the stage, precipitation, soil moisture, and evapotranspiration, respectively represent the supply, storage, and demand of climate forcing. That's straightforward. And since the actual evapotranspiration is hard to measure, we use evaporative demand instead, which is also perceived as thirst of the, of the atmosphere. So which average them onto county and state level based on crop coverage. Here is a schematic example. So the four kilometers climate data in the center is a coarse grid comparing to the 30 meters crop pixels on the left. We counted the number of, for example, corn pixels within each grid. Then for a specific region like this county, we did the uh, weighted average to all the grid cells regarding the number of corn pixels inside them. Finally, we will have the county level climate drivers exclusively for corn. In this case, every type of crop will have a unique set of precipitation, soil moisture, and evaporative demand for the county, making these drivers crop specified. So these drivers are just daily absolute values. They make no sense if we don't compare them to historical record. Then comes the index that shows the relative position of a single value in history. We applied the same method to all climate drivers, and we got SPI, ED, SPEI, and SSMI. I'm not gonna go deep into the algorithm today, but one thing to mention is that higher SPI means wetter while higher eddy means drier and vice versa. Now someone may ask, 
why bother doing all this transformation? We have direct benchmarking on those climate drivers. Well, indeed, but those benchmarking are usually without time scale, which is a key feature of indices. We know phenomena in nature got their time scales just like animal. But drought, how fast the onset, how long the duration, and how quick the recovery directly determine the type of drought and the damage done. You can tell three weeks of extreme dry or six months of moderate dry, which one is more harmful? It depends, right? The drought we are talking about in this study is within one year, usually regarding a short term, but still has quite a wide range from weeks to seasonal. Such time scale have their unique manifestation, hazard, and predictability factors. Precisely filtering out the most relevant time scale can help us better understand the impact. And that's all for data and method. See, we did a lot of pre-processing before diving into any real analytical work. Here are some res results on correlation analysis. So we did Pearson correlation between drought indices and annual crop yield. This one is for corn silage. Maps are maximum correlation. For different indices, red, positive, and blue, negative. We have all the depths for soil moisture from 0 to 10 centimeters, 10 to 40, as picked here, 40 to 100, and 0 to 100. We can see the pattern is consistent in Pennsylvania, while in New York, exceptions are around the mountain and next to Lake Erie. There isn't as much corn coverage in New England, so no significant result there. On the right is the state level histogram. You will see the correlation past 0.5 in most areas, while in some states even past 0.7. That's a pretty good result, considering some of the value may be balanced by regional disagreement, like shown in the maps. If you look at a specific county, like this one in Pennsylvania, we will see almost all indices passed a correlation of 0.8. Not surprisingly, SPI and ADE show quite the opposite, as positive ADE and negative SPI indicate drought, which hinders crop yield. Another thing we found was that SPEI was dominated by SPI. This is evidence that the Northeast is still dominated by precipitation. The mass of water during precipitation is always way more than the evaporative demand. Only a limited portion of such amount of water would be stored in the soil or ecosystem. So it doesn't make much sense if we, if we take the, the arithmetic difference of precipitation minus evaporative demand. And that's why SPEI and SPI results are so similar. And it reminds that we really need to look at indices from distinct sources, for example, SPI versus Eddy. Then we have the corresponding month and time scales of these maximum correlations. This table is quite useful. I'll focus on the New York and Pennsylvania as they are the most corn, they have the most corn coverage. In Pennsylvania, the months are August all the time, all the same, yeah, with Eddy and SSMI generally shorter than SPI. In contrast, the situation in New York is kind of messy with SPI and SMI in the fall, Eddy in the late spring, and SPEI in the preceding winter. The discontinuity could be explained by the mixing of topography as well as fecal hydrological factors. Unlike shallow valleys in Pennsylvania, the spe we speculate that crops in New York may receive more influence from the mountain snowpack or lake effect. But either way, the time scales of max correlation for eddy are always shorter than others. I left out New England states, not a lot of corn there, but still some. You're very welcome to point out any interesting findings from New England, like, like this one. We are only showing the timing of maximum correlation here. There are other ranges of correlations and their timing distribution matters as well. So we believe this is far from a systematic theory, but a good start. Now the timing distribution of correlation as opposed to the maximum correlation. It helps us uh, quantify how much 
a certain month or time scale is better than another. This is sample image is for corn silage in New York State. I only include the SPI and EDI here for simplification. X-axis shows the date and Y-axis indicates the time scale of accumulation before that date. And colors are correlation values. We can see several maximum throughout the year, one in the preceding winter, one in the summer, and one oppositely in the spring. All these shapes slightly inclined to the right, which makes total sense. Longer the time scale, later the end in month. One thing we found interesting was the, was the opposite pattern in the spring. It showed that less precipitation and stronger evaporative demand during this time window would be good for the year's crop production. We're still wondering why. One assumption might be the flood activity due to snow melt and raining in the spring. So I only covered corn silage in Pennsylvania and New York. In fact, for all the above analysis, we have them for every crop type in every county and state. It's just not enough time to go through them today. We will submit a paper covering them all, and we are happy to generate report for certain crop in any county or private farmland upon request. Uh, and that's all for the correlations. So the second big result of our study is to track the progressing of crop health during drought events. Before that, we need to select two outstanding drought years based on crop condition. For the Northeast, there was once an extensive dry period in the 60s last century, but we just don't have the data that far. So these curves are, show corn condition in selected states since 2014, and that's the earliest year we have for corn. We prefer to, we to refer to those conditions as crop health scores from poor to excellent. Not surprisingly, 2016 and 2020 are among the worst years. Since most of these degradations started in June, we think it's safe to target them on growing season drought for corn silage. One thing we found interesting is for the New York State, it seems after a crazy downfall in the middle of summer 2016, the degradation was held back quite a bit and stopped getting worse comparing to other states. Looks like some New Yorkers found the disaster in the field and thought they should do something, which I guess they did, and the situation never went worse. And 2020 was even better. So should I give the credit to any local management in New York? Another data set, regarding the pastoral land tells a similar story, which contains 20 years of record, also shows that 2016 and 2020 are among the worst years for pastoral growth. Some exceptions may reside in New York and Pennsylvania for early years of this century. It might be the result of ranching or other unknown management factors. In general, 2016 and 2020 are still quite outstanding in both years most part of the region showed moderate or worse drought condition in late August on the U.S. drought march. Now, tracking the crop health with drought indices. I only included SPI, EDI, and SPEI here for better visualization. And this is only the one month timescale for corn silage in Pennsylvania. I choose to show it because the one month time scale seems best capture the signal. So the green markers and the y-axis on the left are crop condition, while color curves and y-axis on the right are drought indices. In mid-June 2016, Eddie switched up and SPI dropped down. Such a pattern persists for about two months and the crop started withering at the beginning of July. Even though SPI switched back to positive in August, Eddie remained very high, and the, the crop health continued its way down in 20. Yeah, continued its way down. In 2020, the crops responded to drought indices even faster. The degradation started right after the switching of indices, and so much extra rainfall in the August could not save it from going down. All such patterns can be best found on this one month, one month time scale. 
with slightly worse on the two weeks time scale and much worse on the three months time scale, which I think locks the best time scale around one to two months. Worth noticing is that above two weeks and below three months are is exactly the regime of subseasonal forecasting. And that's all for my part today. Here are some take home messages. Uh, first, we can confirm that there are strong connections between crop health and drought indices in the Northeast. Such connections vary significantly by region, season, and crop cycles. 2016 and 2020 are the worst two drought years regarding crop health. And within these two years, around one to three months of extra evaporated demand and deficit precipitation are most responsible for crop degradation. With the time scale for evaporative demand slightly shorter than precipitation. We have confidence that the findings of this study, not just the result, but also the method applied, can practically be a reference guide to help the Northeast students make better, accurate decision on drought monitoring as well as prediction. We also hope the findings of this study can be integrated into the U.S. drought monitor in the future and contribute to the weighting algorithm for the Northeast region. And that's for my part. Thanks. And I'll hand it over to Dan again. Well, that was great. Thank you so much for presenting that, Adam. Um, yeah, if you do have questions for Adam, please uh, enter them into the questions box and we will uh, have a, a Q&A session at the end of all the presentations. Um, that was some uh, a, a great summary of some very uh, detailed work there, Adam, and so we really appreciate that. Um, so we're gonna shift gears here and I am gonna present on snow. Um, and specifically about snow droughts uh, in the Northeast US. Um, and so I'm going to talk about how we can identify uh, and track them uh, in the Northeast as, as the, the topic hasn't um, been researched that much. There's been a lot of focus on the, the Western US and um, where I am located. And so this is a picture from last winter in the uh, Mount Rose Wilderness right outside of Lake Tahoe, uh, where we definitely had a snow drought year last year. So I'll discuss a bit about what it means to to uh, quantify these snow droughts. Um, so the, the term snow drought, it's, it's a relatively new concept to the research community. Um, and the, the term was used loosely with no real formal definition until about two, 2017 uh, when this, this paper by Harpold et al. came out. Of course, we, we've always known that um, when studying uh, drought and, and hydrology that, that the snowpack matters um, and that below, below, nor, below normal snowpack uh, can, can drive, drive drought conditions. But, but in terms of an actual formal definition for snow drought, that actually didn't come about until two, 2017. Um, and so what they did in that, that uh, paper there was really discuss two types, two main types of snow drought, a dry type snow drought and a uh, warm type snow drought, and so when we when we talk about a dry snow drought, uh, that is just sort of the the common term uh, meteorological drought, where you have less snow uh, on the ground due to a lack of precipitation, and you wind up with below normal uh, snow water equivalent. I'm going to be referring to that term a lot, or the SWE, which is the amount of water that is is stored in the snowpack. And then the second type, which um, has gotten a lot of attention, particularly with some of the recent snow droughts in the West um, in 2014 and 15, um, is this warm type snow drought. And this is where you can still have uh, plenty of precipitation. Your, your precipitation for the year might be near normal or even above average, but you still wind up with a below normal snowpack. And um, that is, is a result of uh, could be more uh, precipitation falling as uh, rain rather than snow. And, and um, so both types of these snow droughts result in, in below normal snow water equivalent. Um, so as I mentioned, there's been a lot of, uh, most of the research 
so far uh, for, for snow drought has been focused on the Western US. And so these are just a few of the snow drought papers that came out over uh, the last five years or so. And if you enter a Google search for snow drought in the Northeast, you won't really uh, find much, um, particularly around these newer definitions of snow drought. And so one of the problems has been um, this, this challenge with monitoring snow water equivalent in the Northeast. And so what I'm showing here on the left is a map of the NRCS Snowtel uh, network. And this is showing the snow water equivalent from April 1st of, of 2021. And we see all the, each one of these little dots is a, a station and you see them scattered uh, pretty densely throughout the mountains uh, in the Western US. But here we are in the Northeast, um, you know, there's plenty of snow in the Northeast as well, but uh, the, the network, the Snowtown network has not been established. There are a few uh, random stations throughout the Northeast, but nothing like um, what's in the West. There are different um, aspects of why you would have a Snowtel network in the West versus East. Um, and in the West, it was mainly implemented to support uh, water supply, forecasting, which of course a lot of the, the Western water supply comes from the, the mountain snowpack, but it's still very valuable in the Northeast. And so this, this map on the right um, is showing where we have uh, seasonal snowpacks. And this is a, a new paper by uh, Ben Hatchett, one of my colleagues at, at DRI. And, and what the, these colors are basically showing is where you have the tan colors uh, that's that's an ephemeral snowpack where each year, if, if you get a snow event, the snow tends to disappear very quickly. And as you get in these darker blues, uh, closer to the number one, that is where, um, you know, on average each winter you have a, a continuous snowpack, meaning 60 plus days or more with continuous snow cover. And so we see a lot of these darker blues in the Northeast, especially in uh, New England and, and parts of uh, the Adirondacks in New York. And so, yes, we do have this seasonal snow and it is important to understand these snow droughts also uh, in the Northeast US. So if you don't have the Snowtel network, what can you use to monitor SWE uh, in the Northeast? So I have a couple examples here um, highlighting New York with a couple of data sets that I worked with for this study. Uh, the one on the left is a gridded or modeled snow water equivalent um, called SNOWDAS. And so this is a one kilometer spatial resolution grid that covers the whole US um, and it is updated daily. Um, and then on uh, the right, I'm also showing this, the snow survey network uh, from New York and the, the mapping from the Northeast Regional uh, climate center. And so um, in the Northeast, New York has a very well-established snow survey that goes back uh, many decades. Um, and Maine also has a very well-established uh, snow survey where you can have uh, get some of this valuable information from these, these long-term snow survey networks. Um, I will mention that New York also has a mesonet now that uh, monitors snow water equivalent as well, but we don't have a long history uh, to, to look at things like anomalies uh, from the snow water equivalent. And there are also a lot of other, other gridded products, reanalysis products that you can use that do have a snow water equivalent variable. Um, a lot of them are coarser than, than SnowDAS, a lot higher, um, a lot coarser spatial resolution. Um, and so we chose to use uh, SnowDAS for, for this study. Um, and so one thing we we're interested in if we were gonna look at snow droughts with SnowDAS is, is uh, how well does it compare to the observations? And so, um, again, this this uh, focused on New York. I also did the same thing for the Maine Snow Survey. Um, and so, on the left, we have uh, the the bias or or uh, the difference between the the Snow Survey um, and the Snow DAS for the period covering 2004 to 2019. And each point there is a Snow Survey location. Um, and this is taking all the observations from all the snow survey months and comparing it to the nearest grid cell um, in SNOWDAS. And so um, we see there definitely are some biases. Uh, there, there appears to be a lot, uh, more uh, purplish colors than there are brown. So uh, mostly uh, SNOWDAS is, is showing higher values than what's being observed by the snow survey. And there are some browns though ind indicating the opposite where SNOWDAS has a lower uh, value. Um, but even though there are biases, the correlations are, are uh, fairly high through, through most of the Northeast, which is shown on the right, uh, the R squared. And so that's indicating that for the most part, SNOWDAS is capturing the, uh, 
the uh, year to year variability uh, uh, fairly well with, with some exceptions. And so another way to look at this is to look at the distribution of the observations. Um, and so again, this is for all the, uh, the, the snow survey points uh, from 2004 to 2019. And so the, the vertical axis is, is the counts of the number of observations. Um, and then uh, the horizontal is the, the actual snow water equivalent value. And so uh, we see SnowDAS is uh, capturing the, the shape uh, of the distribution. Um, quite well. We see a few things. So this big bar here on the left indicates the the, uh, the smallest bin of zero to 10 millimeter values. Um, and so uh, there's by far, that's the highest bin. So there's a lot of zeros in there and there's a lot of very low uh, values there. And SnowDAS and the Snow Survey are, are, are pretty well matched there. The blue, the blue is sticking out a little higher, indicating that the Snow Survey has more of those values than, than does the, the SnowDAS. And as we go down the distribution, we see some of these lower bins. Uh, SnowDAS has more OBS than, um, than the Snow Survey um, and vice versa for other bins. But in general, the shape of the distribution ca is captured quite well. And then on the right now, this is the same, but for the main Snow Survey sites. Um, and a few interesting things here. We, we also see that highest bin, that first bin, the, the about zero to 10 millimeter, um, in this case, uh, SnowDAS is is showing a lot more of those than is uh, the Snow Survey, uh, but there's a, a very different shape to the distribution in Maine compared to compared to New York, and we see that in general at the the highest point in this this bell shape here, um, you know about 100 150 millimeters. The Snow Survey tends to uh, show more in that range than does SnowDAS, but you know in in general. For, for sort of large scale patterns of, of snow, the snow dash seems to be doing a, a decent job. There, there's gonna be some discrepancies once you get into uh, fine details and, and um, but for, for snow drought monitoring, it, it seems like it's, it's doing uh, okay. So um, I want to focus today on uh, uh, the New York Snow Survey to start, and, and uh, we looked at the the, uh, the large river basins, the Huck Six basins, and today I'm going to focus on the, the Upper Hudson, which is outlined here in the left um, in that that teal blue line, and the black dots are all the snow surveys within within that uh, that Huck, and so most of them are in the the central southern Adirondacks, and this is an important uh, water resource region for New York, as well as a, a place to look out for, for flooding implications in, in the spring. And so for the SWE, we used the snow survey here. And then uh, I compared it to some precipitation and temperature data from GridMet, which is a, uh, a, gridded, uh, uh, a gridded weather data product that's available daily across the, uh, the US going back to 19, uh, 1979, which is why I'm doing this 1980 to 2019 comparison. Um, and so on the right here, I'm going to show several of the plots that look something like this. And so these are uh, scatter plots with, with four quadrants. So on the vertical, we have the snow water equivalent percent of median um, at the point at the time of the snow survey. And then on the, the uh, horizontal, we have the accumulated precipitation from December through the time of the snow survey. And so in this case, I'm showing all the snow surveys from January for all these locations um, going back to 19. 1980. Um, and so what these quadrants sort of show you, I'll focus on the bottom here, the, which are the, the drought quadrants, you know, in the bottom left, if you're way down here, uh, you're in that dry snow drought, meteorological snow drought. So you have a lack of snow uh, due to a lack of precipitation. And as you shift over to the right, you get into more of that warm uh, snow drought where your precipitation is above normal, uh, but you still have below normal snowpack. Um, and so I've highlighted a few uh, drought years here to compare. Uh, one is 1980 in blue, and then um, the other is 2012 in goldish color, and then 2016 uh, in red. And so one thing to point out here for these January snow surveys here is that there was almost no snow um, in, in, uh, in January for the 1980 event, and that was largely, it appears, due to a lack of precipitation. The percent of normal precip was 50% of lo or lower. But when you look at uh, 2012 and 2016, it was a bit different. Uh, 2012 had a precipitation near 100% of 
uh, normal. Um, and a lot of values had no uh, no snow. Um, but then if you look at 2016, there's even more precipitation, greater than 120% of normal for a lot of these locations precipitation-wise. And the, the SWE was below 75% and in some cases below 50% of normal. And so there's different ways that you can get to these snow drought uh, locations in time. And so these are the same plots now, except on the left is for February snow survey and on the right is for the March snow survey. And so I just wanted to highlight a few things. This 1980 event really stands out um, in this period as a, a dry anomaly. And we see this dry snow drought in February uh, and March. There is some scatter in March, but there's still this cluster where there's really low snowpack that appears to be due to very low precipitation. And again, 2012 and, and 2015, 2016 are a bit different in that they have uh, snow water equivalents, um, you know, well below 75% of normal, but precipitation anywhere from, you know, 80 to 120% of normal. Um, and by the March snow survey, we see that a lot of these locations had no snowpack at all. Um, and again, they were uh, well above normal for, for precipitation. So we can try to infer that temperature was driving this, but we can also look at how it compares to temperature and what kind of relationships we see there. And so these next two plots are the same as the last two, except I replaced um, the accumulated precipitation with the mean temperature anomaly for that same period. Um, and so we actually see a really strong relationship here, particularly with 2012, in 2016, these were some of the uh, warmest years on in this record, going back to 1980. Uh, whereas 1980 uh, for February, these blue dots here was slightly above normal temperature, um, and March was was slightly below normal. But um, we really see the the 2012 and 2016 were outliers here for temperature, so we can. Uh, clearly say that temperature was certainly one of the driving factors in the in the 2012 and 2016 snow droughts and not so much precipitation. Um, and so what I just showed was basically tracking uh, these snow droughts through a single point in time, but there is certainly uh, interest um, and and utility to to tracking these uh, on the day to day uh, time scale tracking the progression of these snow droughts through time to help understand how they're developing. Um, and so we've been working on the development of what we're calling these uh, phase diagrams. And so they're set up in a similar way to the plots that I showed with SWE on the vertical axis, in this case, precipitation on the, uh, the horizontal axis. And so on the right, each dot is a daily point, and then they're connected by and, and colored by month. And there's a lot on these, and they can be tricky to interpret when you first see them, the first few times you see them. And so uh, we developed uh, this conceptual diagram on the left to sort of help explain these. And you can show these together with these phase diagrams or annotate the phase diagrams to help, uh, to help explain this. And this is from a paper that's in uh, review that's being led by Ben Hatchett. Uh, we also have this on our snow drought tracker, which I will mention at the, the end of the talk. Um, and so this example, again, is for the Upper Hudson Basin, 2015, 2016. I'm actually going to step through each month to sort of explain this instead of just trying to go through all these dots here on this one plot. Um, so let's start out with, with December. And so each one of these dots is a day in December. It started over here on the right where uh, precipitation was uh, well above normal and SWE was below normal. And then for a lot of the month, there was almost no snowpack at all, and precipitation was was pretty low as well. And then by the, at the end of the month, there appears to be a snow event that really increased the SWE in the last uh, few days of December there, which is the, the gold star is the end of the month there. And so next, I'll tack on January in blue. And so we see that here, the precipitation stays near to slightly below uh, Median, but the SWE begins to fall, and then um, by the end of January, the SWE is down here below 50% of normal, um, and the, the cumulative precipitation is above 75% of, of median. Um, and so in February, you know, the precip actually increases to above median, but the, the SWE continues to fall to less than 25% uh, of median. And, and as we saw with the temperatures, that was likely to 
had to do with it being too warm and a lot of these vents were being uh, coming down as rain instead of snow even in the even in the mountain areas. And lastly, if we tack on March, we see that the, the precip falls a little bit towards the end of the month, the accumulated precip, but the Swede tanks to, to, to no snow water equivalent. And, and this was over the entire upper Hudson Basin. And so there's a lot to interpret there. Um, but still, we see the snowpack falls very low by the, by the end of March. And uh, the precip was still you know, near average, maybe slightly below average. And so this was certainly a a warm type uh, snow drought for, for the upper Hudson Basin. Um, and so I'm gonna wrap up there and, and just summarize uh, with a few statements here. You know, the snow course data was very useful to combine with the gridded weather data to examine the historical snow droughts. And we saw that 1980 was uh, kind of an outlier um, for this, this dry type of, of snow drought. And uh, 2012 and 2016 were driven by well above normal temperatures. And so it can be challenging to track snow droughts in real time uh, without the SWE observation network like Snowtel, but gridded SWE or reanalysis uh, could be a very useful tool to, if we wanted to track these in real time. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to provide a few resources. Uh, so this U.S. snow drought tracker we developed at WRCC, the Western Regional Climate Center, um, but it is based right now just on the Snowtel network. And so it covers the Western U.S., and Alaska, but we are actually working towards a gridded product that would cover um, uh, the entire U.S. and where you can produce those phase diagrams for, for wherever you would like. Um, in addition to that, uh, Climate Engine uh, is a great tool where, where SnowDAS is incorporated in there, and this is an example of just the SWE anomaly uh, for February 15th, 2016. Um, and uh, tomorrow, or not tomorrow, next week, there'll be part two of this webinar. We'll be talking about drought monitoring tools, where I'll talk more about uh, Climate Engine, uh, which, I, which I showed there before. But thank you all so much for listening today. Um, and again, just a reminder about the, the webinar next, uh, next week. And with that, I will um, turn it over to Mike Hobbins for the last presentation. So I will pass this over to you, Mike. Where are you? There you are. And you should be getting that. Okay, I hope you can hear me. Um, let's pop this into presentation. So I will be talking about um, flash drought. Uh, it's the latest, uh, latest thing off the presses in, in terms of drought analysis. Um, very fast moving droughts, but I'll, I'll get to that in a second. So this is the same uh, gang of, of characters who have been running this uh, um, study um, from across the country. Oops. Oh, I'm in the wrong. Okay, sorry. So um, the motivation here, in late August of 2020, uh, Nicole Belk, who is a uh, senior service hydrologist at the Weather Forecast Office in Boston, asked the Northeast Dews team, um, are we looking at a flash drought? And why she asked that is because she saw that southern New England was suddenly in D2, which is the, the um, severe drought category in the U.S. drought monitor. And she'd seen a, a two or more category de uh, degradation within a four-week period and a rapid deterioration on some of the flash drought indices. Uh, quick dry evaporative stress index, etc. And then there had been an exceedingly hot July and mid August last year. Uh, this coincided with peak solar radiation for the year, obviously. And um, July saw a less than 75% or even less than 50% of normal uh, precipitation. And she asked, was this a flash drought? Then here we see the, the, the US drought monitor map um, going from just abnormally dry in some areas of northern New, of, of New England. Uh, within seven weeks to a 37% coverage of drought. Uh, so was this a flash drought? That's the motivation here. So first of all, let's step back and ask, what is a flash drought? Well, at its most basic, it's the intersection of drought, where the, the, the land surface is sufficiently dry, impacts, that is, the, the, the drought must last long enough to have impacts, and the onset must be must be fast. So when you meet those three criteria, that's a flash drought. So that's in its most basic principles. 
But um, stepping back to last year, last December, NIDIS ran a workshop that actually examined these questions. What drives flash droughts? Are they different from regular droughts? Um, what are the best monitors for flash droughts? What sort of length of record do we need? Because we need to look at um, extremes of extremes. So these are the extremely fast instances of dry extremes. So we need a, 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 a long record. How long a record do we need? How predictable are flash droughts? What is the physical limits of their predictability? And are we ready to provide a flash drought definition? And if not, can we at least agree on the principles? So the principles being the, uh, any criteria for duration, for rapidity of onset, and for the impacts. So by and large, at this workshop, which is mostly research scientists, uh, researchers in, in the field, and, um, and some users of crop from across the US, but by and large, consensus was that users should be free to pick from a varied harvest of indices and definitions to satisfy their specific sector's needs. And I think Peter Goebel, I've used this quote a lot, Peter Goebel of the, uh, the Colorado Climate Center and a contributor to the US Drought Monitor for the Intermountain West put it best in, in some, of, some of the wrap-up documentation for the workshop. I don't think we should strive for a single mathematical definition. We should we use different data sets and variables. We should try to reach a consistent written definition of flash drought to which researchers can argue their mathematical definitions conform. So he's um, talking from the perspective of a user here. So uh, let's step back again and get some, some sort of physical context of what would drive a flash drought. So this is a, a, a sketch, a cartoon of the local land atmosphere processes involved in drought. So here we start with our imaginary land surface on the left-hand side um, at a point with lower than normal evaporative demand and start the process with an onset of anomalously low precipitation. Now, any increased solar radiation or higher temperatures or winds or low humidity under those conditions will then increase the evaporative demand, which Schwang um, nicely described as the thirst of the atmosphere. So we've increased the evaporative demand, and then we're driving up evapotranspiration if there is water available to evaporate. Eventually, as this moisture evaporates, the soil moisture crashes. It eventually becomes low and, and evapotranspiration is limited. Um, so evapotranspiration then crashes. Of course, if moisture isn't available for evaporation, this step is skipped and evapotranspiration crashes immediately. So in either case, lower evapotranspiration leads to a greater sensible heating and further increases in evaporative demand. So this is a sort of a cascading feedback that dries out the lower atmosphere, reduces regional cloud cover, and increases solar radiation and elevates temperatures, all leading to devastation of crops. So that's a sort of the cartoon version of the land atmosphere feedbacks. But how do we observe um, how would we observe flash drought? So a flash drought is associated with two factors generally, a sudden reduction in precipitation and rapid movement from an energy limited environment to a water limited environment. Now, why this cascade of effects happens particularly fast in flash droughts, that's a hot, uh, hot topic in research. But what we're looking for is the signal of flash droughts. And it's an under, we, what we need is an understanding of the interplay of fluxes and states that allows us to examine the signature of flash drought in a hydrologically holistic manner. So here, this is a little sketch of, of, of a watershed and the relevant fluxes of precipitation and evapotranspiration and states, snowpack, soil moisture, and sorry, the flux of runoff as well, and drivers of, in, in evaporative demand. So what we'd see is flash drought is signaled across the hydrologic cycle and we measure it using a variety of standardized indices. For example, soil moisture is measured using a standardized soil moisture index, precipitation using SPI, which you're all familiar with, Evapotranspiration is used is measured using the landscape evapotranspiration response index, which is something that MTAS um, has put together. Um, it's, for, it's similar to the ESI, the evaporative stress index, and evaporative demand is um, monitored by EDI, the evaporative demand drought index. Um, so, putting these indices in in, in the uh, context of a flash drought metric, we can. This, this is a, a, a sort of a sketch of how we might look at eddy, a, a time series of eddy, this is a sort of a theoretical time series, where it's low, it bounces along uh, below the 20th percentile, and suddenly it rises up from the 20th percentile to through the 80th percentile, um, so or an increase of 50 percentiles, that's actually 60 percentiles, but it doesn't matter. 
um, and it stays above the 80th percentile for two weeks. Or in terms of the SPI, it does the opposite because the, the values are, are reversed in the SPI. So if, if those criteria met, are captured, are, are met, then we have a flash drop. That, that's at least a very simplistic version of using these um, holistic hydrologic um, indices. So what happened in 2020? So here we see on the top, we have the US drought monitor, then there's Eddy and the SPI and SPEI. And these, these, those three metrics are at month timescales. Um, they're, they're, they're looking at every month. And here's the, the, you know, on the top the corresponding uh, USDM. So what we see here, on a, if you look at the eddy, the evaporative demand was significantly elevated for months before the US drought monitor measured anything. So evaporative demand is high in uh, May, June, July, whereas it's not until late July that US drought monitor shows significant drought. Um, SPI was low um, in spring, so so it was dry, and showed wetting in many places in July and August. Um, before crashing in September. SPEI is very similar to SPI, uh, which likely results from a predominantly energy limited environment. SPEI is a, it measures the difference between evaporative demand and precipitation. And in New England, that is really dominated by the precipitation arm of that. So that's just sort of a sort of progression from May to September of the drought, but let's look at um, one of those in particular, his eddy, one month eddy. This is uh, some of the same graphics in the previous one. And you see that, um, one month eddy drought signal preceded, preceded um, the US drought monitor response by many months, which you can't see here, but it showed in the previous one. But it included a late, a dry late winter, a wet spring, but then dry from May all the way through to the end of the year. So one of the questions this raises is, was this um, winter and springtime elevated evaporative demand a precursor to, the, to this drought, or this flash drought? Larry shows a signal of actual ET, and it's very similar to the signal of eddy. Here, um, these, don't be distracted by this gray, that indicates there was little to no evapotranspiration or not enough to calculate an anomaly. But it's similar to the evaporative demand, we see a dry March, a wet April, and then predominantly dry through the rest of the year. So dry being the, the warm colors. So here's for a particular spot, uh, that, that was maps, now, now we're sort of collapsing it down to look at a time series of, of a county just south of Boston. And we see the two, the eddy in the blue sort of um, it's elevated through the spring, it, it dips a little and then it rises rapidly and we, we meet those criteria for flash droughts on the 31st of, of July. SPEI is, is on the opposite axis because it, the, the values are reversed and it would show the same, same, um, same things here that we have a rapid um, crash in SPEI to a flash drought onset on the 5th of August. Uh, similarly, here's, here's one for the uh, coastal hucks, huck sixes in uh, uh, Massachusetts, Rhode Island area. But the interesting thing here is we've, we've looked at the eddy already in the SPEI. The SPEI and the SPI track very similarly, mainly because SPEI is, is dominated by precipitation. Um, but of interest here is this PDSI, the Palmer Drought Severity Index, which we're very familiar with. It's, it's tracking along quite wet and not nice until about uh, the middle of August, and then it starts to decline softly. But it's a very slow decline, and it's we've missed these two um, drought periods, uh, uh, drying periods here, and then we respond to this one. So these two are uh, sort of hidden in the signal. If we're not looking at that, we're only looking at PDSI, we're gonna miss these sorts of drought metrics, these uh, drought signals. Um, okay, I'm actually going to run right through this. This is um, just looking at a time series of soil moisture from using two different soil moisture um, from land service models. One is the NOAA land service model, which has found three flash routes in March, uh, end of May, and what's that, in September. Whereas the Mosaic model, using exactly the same flash drought criteria, only indicates one flash drought on the, on the 14th of August. This is for the top one, 10 centimeters of, of soil. So they're very different, the, the different time series evolution between NOAA uh, Noah and Mosaic. And again, if we look at the uh, NOAA and Mosaic, but now we're looking at a 41 year climatology, how well do they match? We see they didn't really match very well in terms of flash drought, but how well do they match in terms of climatology of flash drought? We see that NOAA, which is the one on the right, this is at the top layer, 
uh, uh, in de increasing depths as you go down, the NOAA um, generates very frequent, uh, <clears throat> very frequent flash droughts. Got very light colors, um, which would, would doesn't seem realistic. Are the mosaic results more realistic? That's a, a question, uh, soil moisture issue to resolve. So here's actually uh, looking at those the same things. Actually, the, the axes are flipped here. So NOAA's on the top and mosaics on the bottom. And you see once again, NOAA's really picked out a lot of flash droughts during that 2020 period. This is the number of pentads in flash droughts. Okay, so I, what I said in um, way back when was was that it's important to look at fluxes and states across the hydrologic cycle because that's where we see signals. We see we see signals. We should see signals in a bunch of different indices um, to, to, to indicate, yes, you've, you've, you've entered flash drought. Or you can pick and choose between them, obviously. So here we're looking at the land surface responses to forcing from evaporative demand and precip. The response is in the top. There's a soil moisture mosaic and soil moisture from, from NOAA. And these are the drivers here, the SPEI, which is um, evaporative demand, the difference between precip and evaporative demand, and eddy, which is just about the demand. And this is the uh, percentiles in each of them. So here you see on the top three, the uh, when, when they go below the 50th uh, percentile, then they're in a dry anomaly. Whereas in the bottom one, the eddy increases uh, to show a dry anomaly. But there is one period, one date where all four metrics agree. There's unanimity between the metrics. That's August of 14th. Even though there was a bunch of different prior uh, drying episodes there's one date where they all agree and there's um lower unanimity if you like or a weaker consensus for early june where you see three of these metrics um three of these metrics agree that there was a flash drought so it just just indicates that uh, a methodology whereby you might examine more than one metric and look at for a sense of unanimity between them for, for to detect the flash droughts Okay, um, I don't have a great deal of time, so I might skip this a little bit, uh, go through this very, very quickly. This is looking at a two week eddy uh, climatology of flash drought for a 20 year period across Conus. And you, what you see is New England and the Northeast is just a hot spot of flash drought. And this um, is not reflected in the US drought monitor, where we really don't see a lot of flash droughts in, 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 um, in New England. And we see them great, you know, in the Southern Great Plains where you might expect to see more flash droughts because the land atmosphere coupling is so much stronger. So this indicates to me that the just using eddy in its very simplistic form, um, is, it, is it transiting 50 percentiles and is it staying above um, the 80th percentile for two weeks or more, isn't satisfactory. And I think what's happening is we're not controlling for the variability in evaporative demand or in eddy. So we need to control for those when we're looking at our um, indices. So just wrapping up here with some science issues in the Northeast drought of 2020, we did see multiple fluxes in states indicating flash drought before the USDM. The question, um, I asked the question, who is elevated evaporative demand a precursor to the drought? And if we had better early warning, would we not have indicated this as a flash drought? Would we have spotted this earlier? That's, a, that's a, um, I think an ongoing question for a flash drought. Uh, like I said, it's important to um, examine multiple indices that bracket the hydrologic cycle um, to examine flash drought. There are soil moisture issues. If you're going to use soil moisture, you have to use um, you know, one high resolution soil type um, soil uh, data set, and you need to determine which one's best for your region. Some other questions of the science is you should use, if you're going to use existing drought indices, you've got to be careful. Do the off-the-shelf existing drought indices work? Well, I don't think the, the two-week eddy um, simple version of the two-week eddy uh, index works for flash drought because it doesn't control the natural variability of that index. And you need, you need to make sure your drought index has a, a long enough period of record. So there is ongoing research on flash drought. Like I said, there was an IDIS flash drought virtual workshop. The link should be in the chat to the report, which is fascinating. Uh, we're moving beyond precipitation and temperature-based definitions. They're being supplanted by a larger array of physical fluxes and state-based detectors. But at the moment, we're not ready to provide a flash drought definition. We're, we're simply relying on these principles of uh, rapidity of onset, dryness, and impacts. That's this uh, Venn diagram again. So from just wrapping it up from the user perspective, at the moment, it might be best to answer our initial question, was 2020 a flash drought or is any ongoing 
uh, anomaly, a flash drive, it might be best to identify that um, from, uh, what am I trying to say, the decision time frame might be best to identify those uh, flash charts. In other words, did did this happen faster than you were expecting? Faster than you can make those decisions, then that's a flash drought. For, for, until we can agree on a definition, I think that that might be the best way for users to, to, to conceptualize flash drought. We do need to determine whether drought responses and mitigation plans and drought plans should be different during flash drought and conventional drought, or is it just a question of timeliness? Can, if, we, if we get earlier warning or better forecasts, can we obviate this whole idea of flash drought uh, responses? That's a question for users, I think, um, to, to, to answer. And um, we have researchers and decision makers have to work together to create, um, to, to, to match the metrics and the time scale to permit the response to rapid onset drought. Or to answer the question, what new is needed to support state level planning and, and trigger responses in flash drought with, with adequate lead time? And finally, I think that users need to, to, to have an ability to pick from a variety of indices and definitions to satisfy the needs that are specific to their sectors and their regions and the season. And I think that's all I have to say. I think I ran over. I'm sorry about that. So I will hand it back or can you take it back, Sylvia? Uh, I think if you could uh, le just keep your slides up just in case we have some questions. Thank you all so very much, Dan, Chuang, and Mike. Uh, lots to ponder and talk about here uh, in our last few mi minutes of today's session. Let's go ahead and jump right in. And I think the best way to do this is I'll just read the questions that I have in the question box uh, from the first one we got, which was early on in the presentation. And then uh, whoever would like to address it, you can just turn your camera on or uh, make sure your mic is on and we'll go ahead. So early on, we did have a question on, uh, this is from Dave C, uh, whether you were using the Coco Ross data products. And I'm not sure who to direct that to. Yeah, uh, I think for our specific uh, studies, we did not use the Coco Ross observations, but I do know, um, for example, I mentioned the GridMet uh, gridded product, which incorporates PRISM, um, and Coco Ross is certainly used uh, in the development of PRISM. So, uh, indirectly, uh, we were using uh, Coco Ross in that way. All right. Uh, next, I believe it's uh, Vicky Z has a question. Original evaporation said not important, but in the end, it seems equally important to precip and rather their net sum tells the whole story. Uh, Vicki, I'm sorry if I messed up that question there, but I think the point is about comparisons between um, the evaporation and uh, precip net sum numbers. Does that kind of make sense? Please take a look in your uh, question box to get a better feel for what Vicky was addressing. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking that might have been for Chuang's presentation, um, talking about uh, for the Northeast, how much importance yeah. precip has relative to evaporative demand. Um, Chuang, did you want to uh, address that yeah. at all? Yeah, there, uh, our results is about uh, the correlation. So the correlation of precipitation and Man with crops are similar. They're about the equal weight, but the absolute value of precipitation is way more than the rubber transpiration, which makes the SPI and SPEI quite similar. Their, their correlation to crops are quite comparable. Yeah, and I think that gets to um, you know, compared to somewhere like the Southwest, where where evaporative demand, like annually, say, is much much higher than annual precipitation, um, it is not the case in the Northeast, where the, the precip is going to be higher than the evaporative demand, um, and way more heavily. But Chuang did show when you normalize these and, and show the contributions that there is there is importance from each of those drivers there. Yeah, and I would <clears throat> I would say that that um, indeed you know the difference between evapotranspiration, evapotranspiration or evaporative demand at least and and precip 
is generally of interest, but given that the SPEI, which which measures that difference and uses it as a drought index, is so similar to SPI, in ongoing drought monitoring, I would rather than look at SPEI, I would look at SPI, and I would look at EDI, which actually separates out the evaporative demand arm of that, of that and can show a different signal because SPEI won't necessarily show a different signal um, from SPE, SPI, even though evaporative demand may be going crazy or maybe maybe shooting through the roof because the signal is so dominated by precip. So I, I think in ongoing monitoring, it's probably best to, to separate those out and look at SPI and EDI as opposed to SPI and SPE. Okay, thanks, panelists. Uh, the next question is Mahesh P. Um, Mahesh, I'm not sure if he's still with us, may have jumped out of the uh, room for just a little while, but the question is, which data was used to derive the SSM index? Um, that, no, Dan, you can, you can, um, I think I think that refers to the to to the to the the um, flat drought presentation. I think, but if so, I think that is from the NLDAS driven. Sorry, the mosaic and NOAA land surface models driven by NLDAS uh, forcing. Yeah, the soil moisture index used in the crop comparison is from NLDAS NOAA. And the next question, um, someone's working on a drought project and in their study, they some years can be considered drought if we look at the six month SPI, but not in the 12 month SPI. And I think we did discuss this a little bit, but if you could elaborate, that would be great. Well, um, I'll take a stab real, real quick. Um, I mean, the 12-month SPI looks at an entire water year, right? I mean, um, whether or not it starts at the beginning of the official water year or not, it, it looks at the entire water year. Um, so you may have an early wet period and then followed by a dry six months. So that dry six months will then be um, reflected in a, in a very dry six-month SPI. So they look at they look at drying dynamics or wetting precipitation that happen at different time scales. Your six-month SPI may may completely that six-month period may completely exclude the uh, snow accumulation season, for example, which may have been a good you may have had a good snow year. So it's important to look at it's important to determine for your sector and your region and season what is the optimal time scale for these these sorts of metrics and mm -hmm. and or use a variety of a variety of time scales. All right, we'll go next to a question from Britt W. Uh, let me just make sure. She says, aren't, aren't you sort of eating your own tail comparing snow dots to the snow survey? The snow survey data is used to nudge slash adjust snow dots. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, it's certainly not an independent comparison, which is I think the best way to compare gridded data to an observation is with uh, an independent data set. But the trouble is, uh, I'm not sure what other snow water equivalent data set from observations to compare to except for this snow survey. Um, I, I still think found it to be a useful exercise. You do still see some, uh, the biases show up where some are wet and some are dry. And I think it'll just help you understand for things like you know, tracking if you want to use snow dust at the daily time scale to, to have a little more confidence that it will sort of reflect uh, the actual patterns that we're seeing in the snowpack. But again, if we had a long-term snow tail network, or, which would probably also be incorporated into snow dust, that might uh, have been useful. But uh, you are right, it, it, an independent op, uh, comparison would have been uh, the way to go. And I guess I could just add uh, both for Britt and uh, your team, Dan, you're, just so you know, there is a project underway 
uh, being led by the North National Weather Service Gray Main Office to do a little bit better about collection of snow data in the Northeast. So uh, hopefully Great. I can uh, have a little bit more information for you during the next session. I'll probably put it in the chat box, but we also hope to have a presentation on the Northeast Climate uh, Webinar, which is monthly in January, uh, summarizing the work that's being done on this new so snow survey data set. So we're getting the data for you, it's coming. <laughs> All right, so we have one more question, I believe, from Tim S. Tim asks, when will data be available for other New England states for the crop health study? Uh, uh, for other states in New England. So for New England, we only have state level corn, hay, uh, maybe soybean and winter wheat. Mm -hmm. That's just all that we have present. So uh, if you're asking about count level crop data in New England, well, I think uh, we, we sent special requests to the NAS service, but has had no response. So maybe maybe if if you you want us to uh, to generate a report for a specific farmland or a specific region, then you probably need to offer the the crop the instead of uh, asking us to download it from the NAS surface because they just don't have it. And I'll just add that uh, we do plan to to publish the work for, for all the states in the Northeast. Um, so that will be uh, coming out. And uh, we, we can also share the, you know, the, the, the final results, um, you know, in, in, a, uh, in, a, in a public uh, place to share that if there's interest in, in having those results for each, uh, you know, county or state where it's available. Yeah, and, the, and it seems that the, Premise the, the 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 precondition that a certain county in New England or a certain state in New England has available data is that there is enough crop coverage in that state or county. For example, for potato, we have a couple of county in Maine have got the data, and and other others are just like this. So, yeah. Okay, we've got actually, I think, two more questions and plenty of time to get to it. Uh, next, I believe, is Glenn K. Glenn asks, not surprising that two week eddy is too sensitive, but how well does one month eddy or one month SPEI serve as a flash drought monitor? Uh. So, so I think there's there's two ways to look at this. One is one is to look at the the, the sort of metric that that uh, Pendergrass et al. propose, which is that your index, whether it's one month eddy or two week eddy or SPI, um, increases by you know half of the percentiles, 50 percentiles, at, to to a drought to drought one or D1, 80, 80 percentile, and stays there for two weeks. That Okay, in the two-week eddy period, is way too noisy uh, because because eddy goes up and down. It, 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 that's that two-week eddy goes up and down, but longer memory eddy and longer memory SPI won't go up and down so much. So it would be interesting to apply exactly the same criterion to a longer memory index, ask it whether it goes up by eight percentiles and then stay stay steady, and for sure it would be less dynamic. Um, it it may not offer the same early warning potential. But it would be less dynamic. The second um, thing I wanted to say is, whatever your times, whatever your time scale of your index, whether it's SPI, PEI, or Eddy, you need to show for, for, for to establish a flash drought. What you really should show is that your index changed much more than it would normally change during that period. So it's like a differential. You're differentiating the time series and looking at that quantity. So it's the change in eddy. Is that unusually large, or the change in SPI, is that unusually large compared to 
what always happens during that, what normally happens during the, the last 40 years of that climatology. So that's um, the framework of Otkin et al. That using the rapid change index, for example. And that's something I'm working on um, incorporating into Eddy, and then probably not going to do this this sort of Pendergrass et al. Um, uh, um, simple metric. So you have to control for the natural variability in your drought index, and it has to be an extreme version, extreme instance of that natural variability to 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 be a flash drought. Uh, longer time series, the time series length, I don't think it should matter if you're going to do that. I hope that answered your question. That was kind of long, sorry. I like it. Uh, I think, uh, oh, Mahesh, you're still with us. Say, uh, glad that we can ask this second question from you. Have you used SMAP soil moisture data from NASA uh, for the drought analysis, um, I I think thus far we we strictly used the the NL DAS soil moisture, but uh, um, and we are aware of SMAP and and you know of course a whole nother study can compare flash droughts with different soil moisture products, which would be an interesting thing to see uh, how much they vary or or agree or disagree. So uh, that's a good question. But one of the important things is that we do have a really long clim climatology, that we have as long a climatology as we need to establish those extremes of extremes. And if we, before we start implementing another data set, we have to make sure that it, it's got a long, coherent climatology. Yeah, I agree, I agree with that. So, yeah, because the crop data we have now is starting in the 80s, last century. So the idea is soil moisture data should be in or the same period. Okay, uh, we have time for a question from John K. John asks, is there ongoing research on the impacts of flash drought on river discharge? I don't know. I presume so. I, I, I think if there isn't, there should be. I'm not doing it, but... Um, that would be fascinating, particularly in um, smaller smaller basins. I think you'd definitely see a, a signal in smaller basins. Dan, you've done some research into looking at um, evaporative demand, the eddy and hydrologic uh, drought in in California. I don't know if you've looked at it in terms of flash drought though. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's been a bunch of research done in the West looking at longer time scales for hydrologic drought. You know, the, the uh, drought indices six to 12 months often relate to stream flow um, pretty, pretty strongly uh, correlated to the, the stream flows. Um, but uh, no, I have not looked at the sort of the impacts of the flash droughts on uh, river discharge. I think in particular natural, uh, 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 Basins without human, uh, without dams um, would be very interesting to look at there. Um, and smaller basins, like Mike said, that could be a really interesting place to go with the flash drought research. I'll make note of that for the next uh, Northeast Dews meeting as a topic uh, that should have a little bit more attention. And there's probably quite a bit that's been done, but I, I don't have it on the top of my mind. Maybe I can get, get some information on that and some links back for the next session. Uh, Glenn Kay has another question. Forecast values for ag drought measure is more important than retrospectives. Let me say that again. Forecast values for agricultural drought measure is more important than retrospective. It's easy to notice and measure how dry it is, but by then the damage is done. For water use decisions, knowing what is likely over coming weeks is much more useful. So I right. think that's a common narrative out there if anyone wants to add to that. Yeah, um, I mean, go ahead, go Mike. <laughs> well, I was just gonna say, um, it's, this isn't work that I do, but we do it in our shop. Um, Andy Hoyle is a, a really good person to talk to about this in, in the physical sciences lab here in Boulder. Um, yeah, establishing the, predictability or the physical limits on the on on, on prediction of um, 
how flushed out is um, very important, clearly. Um, and until we until we know what predict, the predictability is, we, our forecast is sort of wanting. I think um, we are uh, working on on implementing Eddie in the Climate Prediction Center um, over the next year or so, and they want to in, incorporate it into the, their drought outlooks, um, which may get to your question a little bit, though they they tend to be fairly coarse in, in spatially. Um, but yeah, and I know, I think, Dan, you've, you've, you've done some work on forecasting, Eddie, am I right? Yeah, so we've done a little bit of, on the sub-seasonal to seasonal time scale, seeing how well uh, specifically evaporative demand forecasts uh, do. Um, but I'll just uh, add for this project, we really wanted to focus on the, the historical components to understand uh, what was going on in the past and, and actually to try to and help uh, inform uh, future work that goes into forecasting things like uh, flash drought or ag drought. Um, but yeah, of course, there's there's going to be a lot of value if we can if we can um, work out a good good system to forecast these flash droughts, you know, weeks in advance, uh, which is certainly pushing the limits of, of uh, forecast timescales once you get out to a couple of weeks. But uh, there is, is research being done in, in that area, too. And I think an Intiaz in the chat makes a good point that that um, at least until, uh, until we get um, a better measure of, of the predictability of, of these sorts of droughts, uh, knowing the antecedent conditions is really important, um, and it, it's probably more significant. Like uh, for example, in, in the um, in the presentation we saw we saw for example uh, Larry, both Larry and Eddie, which is the evaporative demand and the actual evaporative inspiration. Um, indicated drought in the months beforehand, months before the USDM um, uh, monitored, uh, measured or indicated drought, but also that's that's the spring setup, for, uh, the, or the or the late winter to early spring setup for for then the drought in the summer, um, and making sure we capture those conditions is is crucial for for any sort of predictability in going through the growing season. And I'm. I think this will be our last question that we'll be able to include in the webinar today. But again, if there are additional questions in there that I haven't gotten to yet, we will try to make sure that those get addressed uh, appropriately via email to, from the right individual. But it's the zinger question of the day. Get ready, everybody. Uh, this is from Carlos V. Are flash droughts more severe than a normal drought? And is climate change going to increase the frequency of flash droughts? Tough one. I would. I mean, I would say they are because not necessarily because the the dryness is 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 any more severe, but because the onset is so rapid that they that they sort of cut inside your um, a user's decision making um, cycle, and it's hard to catch up. Um, so, so your response trigger may be too late. Uh, you, you, you may have missed the rising limb of the drought, as it were. Um, so, in that regard, I would, I would say flash droughts are more severe. But we should also note that flash droughts, and I don't think I made this point very well, flash droughts are not short droughts. They are just rapid onset droughts. So, when we talk about flash droughts, the flash isn't on/off; it's on, right? So it's like how quickly you get into drought, and you can stay in drought for years after that. The flash is at the, is at the start, or they can actually um, happen inside of an existing drought, but that's not really relevant to the question. Um, so I would say they are at least as impactful as regular droughts because of the celerity. Wish we had more time for that one, actually, but we're going to wrap it up for today. I want to say thank you very much to Dan, Chuang, and Mike, and a special thanks to Adam for organizing and uh, doing a lot of the behind the scenes work. Uh, we would like to again thank you for joining us. Uh, the flash drought uh, virtual workshop report is in the chat. So please grab that link before you leave us today. Um, we'd also like to um, remind you to explore drought.gov both for additional information on flash drought, the soil moisture networks that are under development and some other topics. You can also watch for uh, a link 
to this to the recording of this webinar, uh, both on drought.gov and via email. And finally, just a, a reminder one more time to join us again next week, same time uh, on Tuesday for the Coping with Drought CWD session number two. Uh, thanks again, everybody. And be well and have a good day. We'll see you next week. Thanks, Sylvia. Bye.